Hi everyone. Uh, sorry about the delay and we'll start. Uh, my talk is basically about uh, writing bindings to native libraries uh, in to Node.js. So let's say you want to use uh, something like an image processing library, say OpenCV, or you want to port Node.js to a smartphone and you want Node.js applications to be able to access smartphone APIs like the phone call API or the contact book, so on. Right? How do you do that? How do you <coughs> integrate C++ libraries and Node.js? That is what the talk is about. Uh, if you are interested in generally knowing about the internals of Node in some sense, then also this is a good talk for you. Uh, so basically Node is a small wrapper around the V8 JavaScript engine, which is makes scripting JavaScript, I mean integrating JavaScript into other applications as easy as something like Lua and it's quite possible that JavaScript will be the new Lua someday. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to follow the slides and code as a setup, uh, all the code itself is uh, like you can try it out as I go along. So, what we want to do is use C libraries in Node.js, exchange data between C and JavaScript, and uh, the main part which is do asynchronous IO with Node. Uh, I don't know if I have enough time for the async IO part, but let's see what happens. Uh, yeah, this talk is very code heavy. You will see a lot of C++ on screen. So if you have any questions at any point, just uh, like stop me. Uh, so the very basic thing, like the first simplest node module you can write. How many of you have written node modules in JavaScript play? Use multiple files so that you do exports dot something, right? Okay, so three or four people. So, uh, just like you have exports in JavaScript, uh, what you do in C++ is that first of all you include obviously the V8 and Node uh, header files and then you define this function called init and you tell Node using the Node module macro that my uh, module is called first step in this case and to set up this module call this function called init and this init function can then set, set up the module as you want it. Right, so just like you have the exports object in your JavaScript modules, you have this target object in uh, C++, so you can set properties on that and they'll show up in your module. I will explain the handle and object and these things as we go along. So this is like the basic template. Every node module you ever make will have this, right? So how do you build, how do you compile this? So uh, node uses uh, this tool called WAF, W-A-F, for its compilation, which is basically a Python replacement for make. Uh, so this is like a simple make file, I mean a W script file for uh, where you set that it's a C++ project and you have this node add-on thing which can, which includes certain node related libraries like V8 and node itself. And then you tell it to build a module called first step using the source file called first step.cc at the very end. Right, so this is again something that is common. So in all the code that is in my Git repo, you will find every directory has a build file and so on. So you can just directly compile it. So to compile it, you do node dash warp, which is a slightly modified form of warp. And you say configure and then build. And hopefully it builds successfully and then you can use it. So just like you require modules in node, require normal JavaScript modules, you can do the same thing with your C++ module. So you just do require and the path to the module itself, right? And if you compile this module, then this is what you would get. Uh, because it's like you haven't actually done anything in the module, it's just an empty object, right? Uh, so this is basically what Node is. It's V8, it takes this library called lib uv, which does async io and all those things. And it wraps the entire thing and calls it node.js and your binding is the one in red. So that interacts with V8 and the library part is your native library. For example, OpenCV or uh, SSH. For example, a lot of libraries in the node core distribution itself, like the crypto library and Zlib and so on, are written exactly as I'm going to describe, right? So uh, V8 itself has good API documentation, uh, but it's not officially hosted on their website. So this is one of the places on the web where you can find it. Okay, so now let's go back to the code. You see this handle object target, okay? So uh, what V8 does is, since it has to do garbage collection by itself, 
right? Uh, it's going to pass everything through this handle uh, wrapper. You can think of handle as a smart pointer, which keeps track of how many references there are to uh, V8 objects and so on. And the wrappers, in a sense, also uh, you know encode the scope of that variable itself. So as long as any V8 object has at least one handle referring to it, the garbage collector knows that I'm not supposed to delete this and it will keep it in memory. So handles are of two types. There's local and which is also alias as handle and is persistent. As soon as the local handle goes out of scope, the garbage collector is free to delete it. And a persistent handle is not deleted manually by, I mean, not deleted by the garbage collector. You are manually supposed to tell it to delete. So, uh, you will usually use persistent handles when you want to pass around data through multiple function calls and store them around for later. Otherwise, you'll stick with local. So, let's yeah, get directly to implementing functions. Uh, this is a simple JavaScript module. Like you would say, export short square equal to whatever that's implementation. And then in another node module, you could just do require, uh, let's say this is called square.js. You could do require square and then you could do square dot square itself and call the function. So how do you do this in C++? Okay. So there's like, uh, it's pretty simple, nothing too complex. You just say like the target object, just like you do export short square, you do target dot set, the last line of the code. You do target set, the name of the function and the corresponding function itself. So any uh, C++ function which has to be called from JavaScript, right, has this uh, signature which is the first line itself. Uh, it should return a value and of course the function name and then it takes this arguments object which is used to transfer JavaScript arguments from JavaScript to C++, right. Uh, then in the init function I have created this function template. So I will explain what a function template is in a few slides. Uh, think of it as saying that telling V8 that this C++ function should somehow be magically pulled into the JavaScript function, right? Uh, and so you use this function template to uh, allow that. So you function template and then you tell the function template, give me an instance of the function and then you inject that into the target. So this is equivalent to export short square function, right? Uh, now I'll actually go and implement the function itself. So this is the function implementation. Uh, just like I had a square, I mean, uh, I'll go and implement it. So args is something like an array, okay? Just like you get one one uh, argument, named arguments in JavaScript, you can extract them by index in uh, C++. So I'm taking the first argument in the arg zero and uh, right here, oops, and uh, extracting the integer value from it. Then I square it, this is like normal C++. And then I do scope dot close integer new square. So at this point, I would like you to realize two patterns in writing bindings. One is that anytime you use a V8 uh, class, you don't do a default C++ new, uh, you know, new operator. You use the, the static functions capital N new. And that's because the again, the garbage collector is doing a lot of backend bookkeeping and using these static functions uh, allows it to keep track of all that, right? The other thing is this handle scope thing. So as I mentioned before, there's local handles and persistent handles, right? So local handles, uh, V8 maintains a corresponding stack of some sort uh, about what variables are in scope currently. And when like, so a handle scope is like adding a new stack frame in V8's garbage collection thing. Right, and then you say that any uh, new values, like any new handles that are created in this scope, right, once that scope is popped off, you can delete all of them. Okay, so the only problem is that a return value has to go back to the calling function, right? And if that was deleted when this function ran out of scope, then that's not good. So, what scope.close does is it goes and accesses the scope that was in scope before, like the handle scope that was in there before on the stack and it makes this whatever you pass in the close as parented to that so it doesn't get deleted. Uh, basically anytime you want to return something it's best to wrap it in scope.close, right? Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. You don't need to instantiate the scope there? Uh, yeah, if you see the first line it's handle scope scope and that's basically all you need to do and internally it will uh, handle. So, uh, 
this is like the analogy from C++ V8 to what happens in actual JavaScript. So function template itself doesn't have a very good uh, JavaScript analogy itself. Uh, it's more of a way to, you know, uh, before I create the function, I keep it in some kind of paused state and so that I can do stuff with it. Okay, then when I did the get function to get an instance, uh, get function, the return of get function is something like what happens when you refer to a function just by its name, right, without calling it. It's just the function itself, right? Uh, so function template provides certain uh, things, instance template and prototype template being two of them. So using instance template, when we go to like the next slide is object oriented, like how you can create uh, JavaScript objects in C++, right? So when you do that, there's this common pattern where you do, uh, like you do, let's say the inventory is the object. So you have a function and then you create it with new. And when you create it with new, it's like object in JavaScript. So, and then you use this dot items to set properties of that object, right? So instance template is equivalent to this in JavaScript, right? And if you move here, and this is the traditional way of adding methods to a JavaScript object. Like uh, if any instance of inventory will now have add stock and ship methods as part of it, right? So just like that, prototype template is the corresponding dot prototype thing, right? Uh, any questions at this point? Because now we'll go to object orientation. So now we'll start, uh, like, if you actually try running the code called uh, this uh, simple function in uh, the GitHub account repo, right? Uh, you will see this same thing I've like had in the header files and so on, and you can just run it. And if you require the module, it will have a square function ready to go, right? Uh, yeah. So coming to objects. So there's not much difference between creating a function template and creating, you know, objects of that kind. So. Again, it's the same thing. I created a function template, and inventory again has the same signature. If you look at the bottom, right? What I am doing differently is that since I want that this dot items equal to something, <coughs> right? So I get the instance template, right? And uh, on that I set items new, uh, new integer called with a value two fifty seven, right? Uh, and then I say, I inject that into the target itself. So I'm doing exports.inventory equal to the inventory function, right? Uh, the interesting part about the inventory implementation is that it's just one line, return uh, this, okay? So what is going to happen is that uh, just like in normal JavaScript, you uh, the, this pointer is uh, created by the JavaScript environment itself. It's just a empty object, right? Similarly, uh, args dot this is the equivalent in C in V8, and uh, it will be an empty object again created by V8 before it calls your function, right? So you can just return that, and that make, makes it an object, right? Okay, uh, so just like you have a string new uh, symbols are something like internally V8 will. Uh, keep that in some sort of, I mean, it will convert it to a integer. It, we call it interning in JavaScript engines. And what it's going to do is, instead of having to look up by the entire string comparison every time, it's going to say that it's going to assign a unique code and that speeds up the lookup. Uh, so for certain frequently used things, you might want to use it. Uh, yeah, so now this was operating on instance template. So every uh, instance of inventory will have its own items and you can freely modify it, right? So how do you uh, transform the method pattern of JavaScript into C++? That is, how do you set methods on the inventory class? I mean, it's not a class, but we are going to treat it as a class, right? So again, uh, not hard. What I'm trying to show is that this, like V8 has uh, tremendously simplified how you write you know, uh, applications that can interact with JavaScript through and, uh, to and fro, and Node adds certain useful things on top, which I think uh, make a lot of difference. Uh, so just uh, what it's going to do is prototype template. So Node provides this macro called Node set prototype method, and you just pass it the object itself, and then you specify what method it's going to be called in JavaScript. 
and what callback, like the what C++ function is going to be called when our stop is called. Right? Uh, I'll explain why you don't directly want to operate on prototype template and why you would you should use this macro uh, a bit later. But I mean, uh, you, it, it will become clear as we go on why you should use the macro, right? Uh, again, not much difference here. Just get the function and set it, and you should have add stock and ship as part of inventory methods, right? So let's actually turn to the implementation so that we can understand how that object is now internally accessible in C++, right? Again, I have used uh, args dot this. So args dot this will, uh, let's say I do something like uh, var x equal to new inventory, and then x dot add stock, and let's say I pass five. Then in this case, if you were writing JavaScript, this object in add stock would be x, right? So that's what is going to be here too, it's going to get you that this object. And then you just do a get items and get its value, right? Uh, if you understand this uint 32 value and so on, you can just consult the API documentation. Basically, what it's doing is uh, it's converting from the V8 representation of an integer into the C++ thing, right? And otherwise, I'm using this object as a simple some kind of dictionary. I'm just setting and getting problem, right? Very simple. And then I just return undefined. Undefined is just a like convenience function. Similarly, uh, the ship method. So again, I do a get this pointer and get properties. I can throw an exception by just you know uh, calling throw exception and passing it a string. So let's say I'm trying to ship more than I have, and you can throw an exception. So as you can see, up till now we have a very one-to-one -one analogy between C++ implementation of the module and the JavaScript. What you would actually be doing in ship would be, uh, let's say you are calculating, I mean, you are using some native implementation of inventory, right? You would be calling methods of that native library on the instances and uh, then echoing back those values, right? So that is where we come to, I think the most uh, important part of uh, writing bindings, which is object wrap, right? Uh, where you associate native C++ objects with JS objects. And what I mean is that uh, if you see the diagram, there's a V8 object, let's call it OBJ. And V8 objects have these internal fields, okay? Uh, where you can arbitrarily insert data, right? Any kind of thing and V8 won't touch it. You can do what you want with it, right? And similarly, you have this uh, instance INST of an object wrap subclass, which you will create. And then you have the native class instance. So uh, let's say you are having some image processing library and so that library has a class called image. Okay. And for every image that you want your JS app to use, you want a instance of the native image class to be created. So in JavaScript, if I do a new image, you want a new image to be created in your native app, uh, native library as well. So what you would do in that case is that uh, you would create an object wrap subclass, let's call it image in another namespace. So let's call it JS image, so we don't get confused, right? And JS image would contain the native image and would do operations on the uh, native image. And JS image would uh, like handle, uh, it would have methods on itself and it would have fields on itself and expose itself to V8, right? Uh, except what happens is that, how does V8 know that for every instance of OB, like a normal V8 object in the JavaScript space, this is the instance of the C++ object, right? To establish that association, uh, we use the internal field. And this is where object wrap, what it does is it simplifies uh, doing the internal field manipulation. And when you call INHT wrap, so wrap is actually a method of object wrap. And since it's a subclass, you call it, right? And on the OBG, then internally it sets the field. So field number zero is now pointing to the instance of your subclass. Right, and this way uh, V8 knows that this is the association, right? And at any point when you get a V8 object, you can extract the JS image class by accessing the field, right? And uh, the uh, you could you know ditch object wrap and just uh, operate on the internal fields yourself, like uh, instance set internal field count one, 
right? Uh, you need to do this because V8 by itself will not initialize any internal fields. So you need to tell it I'm using one field, two fields, three fields, so on. Right? You could do it manually. Uh, the only thing is that uh, object wrap does some uh, again garbage collection. So uh, you see the difference between JavaScript and C++. And with all your man manual memory management, you know you are in full control. But when you are dealing with a garbage collector that is running parallelly to your program, then you have to be careful that you know the garbage collector doesn't go and reclaim memory that you are using, or that you don't delete memory that the garbage collector thinks is being is valid, right? Because otherwise you get this mismatch and your program set faults. So you have to be careful about that. So this is where object wrap is going to deal with uh, those things, right? So this is our example going to proceed. Uh, this is your native C++ library. I'm calling it library. And it has a class inventory, right? And all this is native code, okay? Let's say in a in a real situation, you would probably have a compiled uh, library which implemented this and you had only the header file and uh, you would go about this. So think of this as a header file which has all these things, right? So uh, we do have to set the internal field count manually because uh, I mean, Node doesn't know which instance we are dealing with. So this object template instance is again like uh, yeah. you create a function template for inventory, and what you get from that template's instance template is the instance, right? And you set the internal field count to one. So you say that every uh, like inventory class in the uh, inventory object in JavaScript has one associated internal field and which you are internally going to point to your uh, JavaScript, I mean, uh, C++ wrapper, right? So in namespace binding, okay, my bindings code, I create a subclass of object wrap, right? And I have this new method in it. So just like V8 has integer new string new, so we use the same convention in our classes so that it makes using them easier, right? And realize that it's static, okay? Uh, any class method, that, I mean any method that's in a class that you want to associate with V8 has to be static because uh, only static callbacks, I mean only static functions in C++ can be passed around as function pointers, right? So they have to be static. And then what you're doing is, in, internally you're creating an actual instance of the same class itself, okay? This class inventory and here inventory, it's the same thing, right? So you create a new instance of that and then you wrap it around argument this, right? Except I'm not using this, I'm using holder. So uh, what's the difference between holder and this, right? Uh, if you realize in the first one, when I was just dealing with the items and getting and setting them, I was using arcs or this, right? And now I suddenly switch to using holder. So what's the difference? Okay, so arcs or this is always the this object with reference to the JavaScript scope, okay? And you know that in JavaScript, you can always rebind functions to other, uh, you know, deal with other objects as this. Uh, except what happens is that when you're dealing with internal fields, okay? So when your inventory had this internal field storing reference to a subclass, right? And then I go and change the prototype of my internal object to point to something completely different, okay? And then when you invoke the method, ask this is actually that different object, which no longer has an internal field and I try to access it and the program uh, crashes, right? So what arcs.holder does is, it makes sure that the, this object you're dealing with is a valid you know, uh, object wrap instance or whatever you stored, so that even if you try to call something, it will fail with a more decent message than just crashing, right? Uh, and this is where node prototype set method. I told you, don't directly go and set the prototype template. Right. What node prototype set method does is it uses something called signature in V8. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But basically, node prototype set method combined with using holder will ensure that it gets called on the right class and I mean right object in the prototype chain. Right. So you can always use holder. I'm not saying use this in certain cases. Use holder in certain cases. It's preferable to always use holder itself. Right. Uh, so getting back to the wrapper. Yeah. So what I've done is now I've wrapped the this instance. Uh, in my wrapper so that this link here is established, okay? And then I return the this object itself because that's our instance. Now this is where the interesting part comes. Since we have wrapped it, 
now we obviously need to unwrap it at some point to operate on this okay so when in javascript the user does x dot ship five items right uh, the this object is going to be x which is a v8 object and that v8 object has the pointer to our internal subclass right so we unwrap it and we convert it i mean we then do our normal operations so wrapper itself has uh, okay so yeah this wrapper itself will have internally keep references to you know the native library classes right uh, in this case it's called inv so what i'm doing here is i am actually calling the native method ship and then i can check the return value and do error handling okay so this is like the simplest binding you can get from uh, javascript to a native library right uh, yeah. any like questions up to this one okay. so uh, how much time 10 minutes uh, okay so we have time to get on the asynchronous io part which i think makes a ton of difference to i mean that's what node is all about right you shift operations that block to another thread and you can process lots of stuff right so what is the concepts involved in getting the yeah. You wrap this uh, same native object. Why should we wrap the same uh, JavaScript object? Okay, so uh, let me clarify. When you wrap, okay, so it's somewhat uh, unintuitive. When I'm doing wrapper dot wrap args dot folder, it's not uh, args dot folder that is being modified in any way, except that args dot folders internal field is being mapped to wrap itself, wrapper itself, right? So if you call it again, it's just going to reset it is the item i mean uh, item important operation such okay. of course if you try to unwrap something and it turns out to be of the wrong type then it will be null right so in all my examples and even in the code i have been very lax with error checking to simplify the code but uh, even like uh, uh, accessing arg0 and then just calling event 32 value is a very bad idea if somebody passes a string then you are going to get a wrong value right so you have to do type checking and so on in production code right uh, yeah so what is the problem we are dealing with when we want to go async right uh, <clears throat> most libraries are not designed to be non blocking okay so when you do file io in normal c you do uh, open and then you read write right uh, until the read doesn't finish so let's say you are reading on a socket until the socket doesn't actually send data read is going to block and your program is going to block right so most native libraries are not designed to be non blocking by design okay like their native implementation uh, so the work around that node does is to allow async uh, node to use uh, synchronous bindings is that it has a internal pool of threads okay in the background and node itself runs on this main thread and using lib uv uh, you it abstracts away the thread pool and so you can give it a synchronous task and will move it off to the thread pool right it will run it over there it will detect that it has finished and it has finished it will notify you to do the further processing right so internally it will use multi threading and simulate the asynchronous <coughs> nature so you need to do three steps to have async bind like convert a synchronous library to a async uh, behavior in node so uh, the first is to use this function called uv underscore q underscore work Right. <clears throat> so this function takes a uh, couple of things. First of all, you will need to define three functions. Okay, just like we had a one-to-one -one from the JavaScript ship to C++ ship, right? So when somebody calls a okay, let me take the code cell. This is what we are going to do. Okay, I have called this async module. I am creating an inventory, and let's say in your company the inventory slowly becomes really full. and you, because you want to optimize it you tell your workers to reshell the whole thing in some sort of order right except that your inventory is so big that reshelling it in the main thread would uh, stop people from interacting with the inventory right so it you want to make an async operation and you want to know when it's done when reshelling is done right so uh, what do you think is going to happen if you just read this code as a node what is going to happen first of all you're going to do the reshell call but then it's immediately going to go and print after reshelling source because this call we want to make it non blocking right then it's uh, going to uh, 
do this pick 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 good give printing it and the native version of reshell okay in your native library in your thing is blocking and what it does in this simple case is it just sleeps for 5 seconds okay so here you're going to get output like after reshell in source then okay i think i have the output. yeah this is what the output is going to be right so how do you do that so because it's like this three step thing you need to define three functions other than one function for every async function you want to use the one the first one is uh, of course the direct mapping like ship will go to ship right uh, except that there instead of doing the operation itself and then returning you are going to set things up and put it on the thread pool right the second function is the one which actually gets run in a separate thread and does the synchronous task so calling the native version of reshell would be done in the second function right and once the second function is done uh lib uv is going to tell you it's done so what do you want to do now right and that is going to be handled by the third function so you usually do garbage collection there and uh call the callback right so how do you transmit data through all these three functions right because you will have some kind of parameter so if reshell was called with what to reshell then you want to pass that into the uh, native library right so we use this concept of batten to pass around data okay uh, so this is the batten in this case i call it a reshell batten so yeah uh yeah so if you see uh, it's not exactly the easiest like till now we are doing pretty one to one mappings but to get asynchronicity in the mix it's a bit cumbersome so uh it might be too much typing effort but it's worth the performance of doing right uh so the first member of the pattern is always has to be this thing called uv work t which is something internal you don't need to worry about that but it has to be the first number okay and then you can create uh, keep track of whatever arguments have been passed so in this case we want to call a callback right so we keep a reference to that callback here <coughs> then we also want to call reshell on a certain instance of the object right so we call i mean we keep track of that over here right and so what is going to happen is when inv.reshell is called a corresponding reshell function is called in your c++ code right that goes and creates this button okay so reshell is going to create this button here right i'm going to set uh, the callback as a persistent function So why I have a mirrored position? Because as a function passed into the callback arguments, it's a local handle, right? And as soon as this reshell function exits, it's going to be garbage collected. So I made a copy of it, which is persistent, to keep it around for later, right? And then I pass the wrapper. So this is like very basic. I'm setting the fields of the button, right? And then I call the magic function uvq work, which is going to handle all the details. So this is the main event loop. So you just get access to that. Then you pass the request along, and then you tell uh, UV that the actual uh, function doing the blocking work is reshell async. And once reshell async is done, I want you to call reshell async after. Okay. So I'll get to the implementation of these two, right? But uh, this is how you do it. Basically, you set up, you do blocking work, and then you clean up. Okay. <coughs> so. Okay, uh, we come to reshell async. Remember that this one is the blocking function which runs in a separate thread. Okay, so you do not, do not, do not do anything with V8 in this function. Okay, do not access any V8 related uh, functions, objects, anything, because it's in multiple threads. All kinds of bad things can happen. Right? Yeah. What do you mean by multiple threads? Yeah. So uh, you know that node is. Uh, yes, runs in an event loop, right? Yes. Yeah, but the thing is, a lot of opera I/O operations that occur are still blocking, right? Okay. Native I/O operations. So to simulate this single-threadedness, uh, the stack of events. Well, there's two sorts of threads. Two different. Yeah, yeah, but the actual I/O operation has to run in another. Okay, whatever node application, whatever operations yeah. that are doing in a single block also still one core only with five threads, but there are multiple cores in that. Sorry. So if you have multiple CPUs on your machine, yeah, multiple cores, yeah, just still running an async operation. Only one yeah. of the cores will spike. Yeah. So no, but there's no question of a core spiking. You're doing so, I/O here. I'm saying that there will be only one process running. There yeah. will be no thread. So if at all you have a loss, a thread will be a child process. 
Yeah. It will be spawned out. So there is nothing spawned out for a node process. No. You have to understand that blocking I.O. has to still be done. Okay. So what's going to happen is let's say your node app does an I.O. request. Okay. And you are saying it's part of a continuous thread, right? I agree. I agree. So what's going to happen is internally it's not blocking. I mean I.O. by its nature is not non-blocking, right? Okay. So even a evented library like EV, like if you run it in the same thread, even if you say it's not blocking, as long as it's in the same thread and you call a blocking function, it's blocked. That that thread itself is not going to move, right? Right. So if you want to uh, have the main thread, which is libev's thread, uh, while I'm doing a blocking I/O operation, you want another network connection to come in and be registered, right? You need to move this blocking I/O somewhere else so that this thread can continue running, right? So internally, Node and libev together conspire to create this thread pool, and any blocking I/O operations are moved off to the thread pool simply so that uh, Node can simulate the uh, Virtual reality of having how just one. For me, top would be the only way. So I can see this spike, spike on a core. I can see that it, the yeah. process has started running in that. Okay. But when you're saying that it stops that operation, picks up a new operation, I thought the CPU cycles are spliced. No, okay. Uh, so I'll just finish up and then we can yeah, yeah. discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. So this is the uh, blocking function where, as I said, don't interact with V8, only do your native calls. So I get the wrapper, I call the reshell function, right? And then in uh, async after, which is called once it's done, you can invoke the callback, right? So this is the output. Uh, if you actually were using a native library, you have to tell walk to link to it when you compile. So Again, you can just add some facts. Uh, yeah, I covered this. So there are a couple of things I didn't cover in this, uh, which V8 provides, uh, especially accessors. So you can, you know, every time a certain variable is set, you can have a callback uh, get triggered and so on, right? Uh, function signatures. Again, I didn't do it because uh, we didn't have time. But uh, details of VV and using V8 on its own. What I mean by that is, if you wanted to use V8 in another application, not in it in Node, just as a scripting language for JavaScript, then how do you do that? It's not much difference between Node and this. You just create uh, context and so on. Uh, but most of the concepts are the same. right? So these are three good add-ons to start browsing the code for if you want to write your own add-on and are uh, confused about some things, then they are a good uh, point to start from. Right? So yeah. Now we can get to the questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So can I just take one twenty seconds? Uh, yeah. I actually wanted to ask you people a question. Uh, I'm just doing like a kind of survey kind of thing. Uh, if like I want to ask you like, uh, what do you think is the one technology or uh, idea or concept or whatever that you think every software developer, irrespective of whether he's a mobile developer or assembly hacker should know and if you like just think about that and you can shoot me a mail or something with your answer okay so yeah, yeah okay so like if any of you has different answers please let me know and i'm just doing a short survey okay. thank you thanks again